A lot of Americans are looking askance at what's currently happening in Europe, citing things like bans on veils and minarets as evidence that old Europe hasn't changed its intolerant spots. The US monitors freedom of religion worldwide as a litmus test of countries' wider commitment to fundamental freedoms. In Europe, on the other hand, there are people who see things quite differently. For them, religion is not the friend, but the enemy of freedom. They may cite things like the fatwa against Salman Rushdie, the murder of Theo van Gogh, the violent protests at the Danish cartoons, and Christian attitudes to homosexuality as evidence of its essential intolerance. From that point of view, it's secularism, not religion, that's now the guardian and guarantor of freedom of expression. And this has led to a pushing of the boundaries of what's acceptable to religious people, particularly through the production of provocative art, drama and literature. Some see this as a kind of purge that's necessary to keep the arteries of free expression open. Thus and so, the disputes between the religious and the secular have escalated, and the battle lines between them have hardened recently. And into this febrile atmosphere comes EU equality law. Progressively adopted by the UK from 2003 till now, this extends protection against discrimination on the existing grounds of gender and race to the new ones of also of disability, age, sexual orientation and religion. So what seems to have happened is that equality's law, far from resolving disputes over religion, has become a stage on which they're currently being played out, particularly by the most extreme fringes of religious and secular opinion in full public view. And I do think that's an important point because there's a very large middle ground of religious and secular opinion, which is in danger of being entirely excluded from these debates at the moment. If we take seriously the idea of respecting people as bearers of beliefs, we have reason to extend its implications to not subjecting their most cherished beliefs to vilification and ridicule. And here comes an important qualification in the absence of overriding reason to the contrary. Now, that means giving weight to what others believe to be wrong just because they believe it to be wrong. And that is not the same as refraining from offence. Now, for upholders of free expression, this proposal may seem no less alarming than vetoing offensive speech. So let me add some reassuring comments. First, different beliefs are necessarily conflicting beliefs. They are necessarily critical of one another. So in a context of diverse beliefs, it makes no sense to demand that people should refrain from criticising or attacking one another's beliefs. That is simply inescapable. Secondly, subjecting a belief to serious critical attention does not constitute disrespect for its holders. Even though a critique may be far more corrosive of the belief than ridicule or irreverence. And thirdly, I have to add... Some beliefs may be so absurd, so depraved, so outrageous, that we have no reason at all to be inhibited by claims of respect. Now, I want to add a very brief postscript to this presentation. A few days ago, Boris Johnson banned a Christian group's advert destined for London's buses, which claimed that people could be post-gay, ex-gay and proud. Now, what was the reason he gave it was that the advert was offensive and, moreover, intolerant. But intolerance consists in preventing, and I do not see what the advert would have prevented. And, of course, toleration itself entails pushing up with what we disapprove of or dislike. We don't tolerate the unobjectionable because we've no occasion to tolerate it. A ban is necessarily intolerant. It may be justified, but its being justified doesn't make it not intolerant. And it should take more and better to justify a ban on speech than a tendentious claim that what is said is offensive. The more we all play the offensiveness game, the more toleration in general, and free expression in particular, will suffer, and the worse off we all shall be. 
Here in the UK, debates about religious freedom are intensifying owing to a great growing number of legal adjudications and cases that are coming before courts throughout um, the UK. Take the following examples of cases that have been lost by Christians in the UK courts in the last four years. Mrs Liddell, a Christian registrar of marriages, argued that a requirement to conduct a same-sex civil ceremony was a breach of her right to freedom of religion and it was religious discrimination against her at her place of work in Islington. She won in the first instance in the Industrial Tribunal, but she's lost in all the other UK courts, the Employment Appeals Tribunal and in the Court of Appeal. She's now appealed to the European Court of Human Rights. If equality for gays and lesbians and same-sex civil partnerships is a constitutional right, then it follows that Ms Liddell is actually claiming an exemption from a general constitutional duty that the rest of us are subject to. Now, Parliament's already decided the scope of that. It's clear in the Equality Act. But should we, should Islington Council be practical, be reasonable, and find another registrar to actually perform that marriage? I think the answer to that is no for the following reasons. It would be a significant step backwards if having won the fight for the right to same-sex civil partnerships, gay and lesbian couples could be shunned by the very public officials who we entrust to carry out key, important state functions and public services. Let me just move beyond the language of rights and move to the language, if you like, of asking you to develop some inner eyes and think about this issue. How would you feel? if a public official was not willing to offer you a key public service? Most crucially, how would you feel if it was because of a key characteristic, such as because you were gay or lesbian? And I want to finish by saying that this harm would reverberate, I think, into the general culture of equality that we want to create in order to safeguard the rights of gays and lesbians in the society in which we live. I believe that the Liddell judgment is correct law and it's correct politics. There should be no accommodation for the religious where the exemption is from a key constitutional or human rights or an equality value. Individuals, no individuals, whether they're Christians or Muslims or any other religious group, can expect to directly influence the provision of public services to the general public with their own personal ad hoc religious believes where that accommodate constitutes the breach of a constitutional right of another citizen. Professor Malik, I think, is in danger of confusing equality of persons with equal regard for behavior and lifestyles of different kinds. In other words, of reifying behavior or lifestyle as if they attracted the same kind of rights as persons. Whether we have, in fact, reached a balance between religious freedom and equality for sexual preferences is precisely the question facing us. It has definitely not been settled, uh, as it appears uh, Professor Malik believes. Race and gender are distinct issues, and we should not confuse them here with sexual preference. Her position st uh, struck me as a kind of ultra-Benthamite legal positivism. Uh, to be expected in a lawyer, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> the law must be obeyed simply because it is the law. In this, she ignores the legal and moral tradition set out, for example, by Bentham's contemporary Sir William Blackstone, recognized even by Baroness Warnock, that morality transcends law, and that sometimes law has to be revisited in the name of morality, and we might say, I would say, belief. She does not refer to the long-standing custom in this country of respecting conscience, especially where it has been formed in a reputable moral tradition as in conscientious objection during war, or even in the workings of the Abortion Act of 1967. Such respect has largely been overturned in the recent equality legislation. Why? Legal positivism can lead to totalitarianism and to a tyranny of the majority. It will not lead, to a, generally speaking, to a balancing of the rights which we need today. I'm a woman. I think some of you may have noticed this. Um, <laughs> religions have not, on the whole, been very... None of them have been, not on the whole, very kind to women. Um, they have not given women much power. They certainly don't give them much autonomy or authority over their own bodies and over their own choices. And this is something that I cannot forget, and therefore I do want to be able 
always to have um, religious freedom trumped by free expression because I want to be able to challenge what is said to me about the uses of my self, my body. Um, and therefore, I can't always treat everybody with the kind of pious respect that religions quite often demand of one um, in the public sphere. That doesn't mean that I don't respect you as an individual and that I don't, you know, I can agree or disagree with what you say after a long argument, but there we are. That's uh, how I feel we should treat things. And I do worry about the kind of litigation that we have now going into Europe um, over homosexuality and faith. I, I don't feel this is particularly useful just in the way that we said before, simply because we will end up in a place where more and more of our very valued freedoms will be eroded as we are pious in our um, re relationship to faith. I also ought to say, I think perhaps to, to, to Lisa, who I also know reasonably well, um, that it, not all branches of all religions have discriminated against women. And I now preside as a, the senior rabbi at West London Synagogue, where we have three female rabbis and one openly gay male rabbi, and that's the team. Our student rabbi is male and straight. Uh, we don't know what to do with him, really. Um, so let me, let me start by saying, making a substantive point here. It seems to me that as soon as we really start getting the law into what is and what is not permitted in terms of religious freedom of expression, we have in some quite important way failed. And I think that that's the, the issue. That, that I think the, the question about respect, which I don't believe means piety. I don't think you have to be pious in respect. Respect means listening with respect. I think that respect and hearing quietly and all of those things are actually enormously important public virtues that we don't really value enough. So where do we end? I think we end with a desire for civilised debate, a, de a desire to speak freely but courteously, and I think we should not allow the breaking of the law once the law has been debated and agreed. You can campaign to change the law, but whilst the law is there, I don't believe we should allow the breaking of it. So Peter Jones is right. I think we need to move towards respect. Respect at the moment has rather a bad name because of the political party in its name. But nevertheless, I think the term is absolutely the right one. Don't vilify or ridicule unless there's a good or overriding reason. And I think that means a bit of self-limitation, not necessarily always going to the law. My name's Darren Newman, and um, I'm an employment lawyer, I guess, of sorts. I, I write and train on the subject. And um, I've spent about 20 years reading, talking, writing about employment law, so it's a, it's a subject that's very close to my heart. And I'm quite distressed at the extent to which my subject has been hijacked by a political debate and is being used as a proxy for a completely different argument. And I think the, the point that... that um, was made earlier that there is a sort of American technique of political litigation um, to, to bring a claim in order to make a political point um, is, is a very valid one. And all of the four cases that have been brought to the European Court of Human Rights, the McFarlane, um, Ladeli, Aweda and Chaplin, are cases um, that have been brought purely because of the political drive that is going behind those cases. Um, and it's a real plea, really, that, that can we just try and step away from discrimination law, because that's a very technical thing, and discrimination law works in a particular way, and those cases are actually not about a clash of rights, they're not about whether it's a good thing for British Airways to have a very strict uniform code that stops people wearing a cross, it's about whether doing that meets certain legal tests about whether it's direct or indirect discrimination. And we're not going to move this debate forward very much about um, public... Public, the, the, the place of religion in public if we just keep getting our discrimination law wrong, which is, I'm afraid, what, what, what tends to happen. I think the primacy of tolerance is clear in what everybody was saying, um, but I think that there was an implication, certainly in the academic speak, speakers earlier, 
that the threat in terms of tolerance seems to be coming from the religious to the secular. As a religious person, the shoe certainly seems to be on the other foot. If I look at the situation in Europe at the moment, with the banning of headscarves, with the banning of minarets, with now even here in the UK with some religious literature, classic religious literature, which has been around for a long time, I can walk into a bookshop and buy a copy of Mein Kampf, but I can't buy a copy of classic Arabic literature, which has some political connotations to it now. It seems to me that the, as I said, the shoe certainly seems to be on the other foot. A number of years ago, Ogilvy and Mather, the advertising agency in America, won a contract from the Catholic Bishop's Conference there um, to do some advertising work. A number of female employees refused to work on it because they had a moral objection to the Catholic Bishop's <laughs> Conference, and Ogilvy and Mather allowed them not to work on it. When I worked in a similar industry in London a number of years ago, the company I worked for had made a corporate decision to work for tobacco companies and to work for gambling companies, but it did not um, ensure, force its employees to work in those, uh, on those jobs. It paid their salaries, but it gave them some accommodation. And that is obviously a model drawn from the corporate sphere, but I want to know the panel's view on why that isn't an acceptable model of reasonable accommodation, paying attention to people's conscience in the public sphere. On the second point, which is about reasonable accommodation, which is Nick's point, all I would say very briefly, Nick, the whole tenor of my paper is you can have religious accommodation up to the point at which you are interfering with the human rights or equality rights of someone else. We treat equality and human rights as the way in which we organise our public life. We don't take the Ten Commandments or natural law theory as our guide to the way in which we treat gays and lesbians anymore. May I plead for uh, arguing on merit and not tarring people with various kinds of phobic brushes, whether it's Islamophobia or homophobia or Chris Christianophobia, whatever it might be. I mean, let's talk about the merits of the argument, please. The employer will be quite right to say, well, yes, you've got your conscience, but I've got a job to be done, and so off you go, get a job elsewhere, which is the human rights law position on the whole. Yet as, I, mean, I think in the context of freedom of belief, on the whole, we have to bear the consequence of the cost of our own belief. And I'm very happy about people as well shifting costs onto other people. Um, that happens a bit under discrimination law, but it is, is well contained, I think contained in the right kind of way. And I think that works both ways, both for people who have got conscientious beliefs uh, ob objecting to, as assuming in this case, working for um, a contract for a religious group and the, and the other way around too. However, that's a matter of rights. What I do think there's scope for is for employers and so on to have discretion. And I mean, I do have some sympathy for Lydia Liddell. I think that um, on the general point, uh, it was right she lost the case. But here was a woman who was in post when the job changed around her. And, and, and um, if she'd been given an exemption, there would have been no uh, gay couple would have not got a civil partnership. Yeah. Now, Liberty intervened in that case and argued that not only were the council, did they have no obligation uh, to accommodate her, they had an obligation not to accommodate her, and had they accommodated her in any way, that would have been illegal. And that was endorsed in the Court of Appeal. That seems to me a sad state of affairs. 